So welcome everyone to this uh, COVID revelations conversation, a part of a series run here in the University of Divinity. Today we're thinking in particular about uh, the Indigenous experience of the COVID and of course there is not one Indigenous experience of the pandemic, there are multiple experiences and we hope to address some of the breadth of that today. Because we're uh, gathering from all over the country and its waterways, I want to acknowledge that this country and its waterways in many different places, uh, the sovereign country and waterways of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I want to acknowledge their elders, those who have looked after this country and its waterways for many millennia. I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal people who will be part of this conversation today, and I pay my respects to them. So those who've joined me on the panel today, my name, by the way, I always forget this bit. My, my name, by the way, is uh, Gary Deverell. Um, I am the Vice Chancellor's Fellow in Indigenous Theologies in the University of Divinity. And joining me today are Mark Yedeka Paulson, Naomi Wolf, Victor Joseph, and Glenn Lockery. We were to have Diane Langham joining us today, but unfortunately there's some stuff going down in the prison where she works, which she needs to attend to, and so she sends her apologies. So I'm just going to ask uh, our panelists to introduce themselves as we go around and uh, get a bit of a sense of where they're coming from. So perhaps we could start with you, Mark. Can you say a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from? Sure thing. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Yerika Paulson. I'm coming to you from the Kwandamuka Coast, as it says on my little thing in the Zoom world. Uh, Kwandamuka Coast is where the Yagra, Turrbal and uh, um, Kwandamuka people set land and waters in what's now known as Brisbane. So I live at Cleveland, where we get to see the North Stradbroke Island just across the water there, Minjeriba. So that's where I live. Um, and uh, it's great to uh, see a number of people from um, that I know from many different circles. So it's great to um, I also, you know, just want to acknowledge uh, for you, Mob in Victoria, uh, going through this particular tough time around the COVID lockdowns again. So um, my my background, um, so um, my my parents were Baptist uh, missionaries, Graham and Iris Paulson, and um, growing up in that environment, um, being exposed to uh, all, all of that, um, all of their legacy. And over the last uh, 30 years, being able to work in um, predominantly leadership, uh, training leadership development work. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's, that's where I'm still, still working, yeah, intercultural and leadership development and uh, bringing the theology with me up there. Thanks. Good on you, Mark. Thanks. Victor, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Gary. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as we are, you're all familiar, my name is Victor Joseph. I'm the current principal of One Topibuya College based in Cairns, which is one of the very few Indigenous theological colleges around Australia. I'm originally from the Torres Strait, um, but I live here in Cairns. Uh, and I also acknowledge my Aboriginal ancestry, ancestry to the Cape York. Uh, in the Shelburne Bay area as well. And um, I, I look forward to contribute as much as I could here uh, this morning, Gary. Good on you, Victor. Thank you. Naomi, your turn. Always got to remember to unmute myself. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Lovely to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm Naomi Wolf. I'm a true way woman. Um, I work as an academic at Australian Catholic University and I'm also the University of Divinity's Indigenous Theologies Project Officer and um, to keep me out of trouble and uh, the threat of boredom away, I have a, um, a role within the NAICS International Indigenous uh, Theological Community 
and um, I uh, work as the academic dean for Australian programs for our um, HDR and our um, uh, coursework postgraduate programs. So, morning everyone. Thanks, Naomi. Now, let me just check. HDR stands for Higher Degree Research. Is that right? Sorry. Yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Brilliant. Just checking. Thanks. <laughs> Work too Glenn. long in higher ed. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Glenn Lockery. Um, I'm a Wiradjuri man from the central tablelands of New South Wales, up uh, past Mudgee, and I'm off country in Melbourne. And I'm probably further off country because I'm in Glen Iris, which is the whitest place uh, a black fella could be a priest. Um, I am a, a priest in the Anglican Church. Um, I'm an artist, uh, a writer, um, and you know, a person in transition. Um, and, I, and I think that's part of the, the journey of, of being where we are, where we're people in transition between our our originality and our presence. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Glenn's uh, written a book recently, uh, which is called On Being Blackfella's Young Fella. I'm giving it a plug because I'm on commission, all right? So <laughs> later on, we'll, we'll mention that again, Glenn, just to, just to make you. sure that people know about thank it. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> I don't um, have too many. I don't have too many cherry rice to give away. Oh, that's all right. I accept licorice and Turkish delights as well, so that's fine. <laughs> so, um, in, in addition to being uh, the vice chancellor's uh, fellow in Indigenous theologies, I'm also a Trelloway man. So, um, Naomi next door there is uh, is a cousin of mine, and uh, I'm living uh, at the moment on uh, Bumurang country uh, here in Melbourne. And so um, I'm not allowed to leave the house much either. Um, so we'll, we'll be reflecting on that experience a little bit later on, I'm sure. Welcome to you all. Um, I'm just going to ask each, each of our panellists a series of questions. And uh, what they do with these things, I have no control over, OK? So I'm just going to ask each of our panellists this initial question. Just tell us a little bit about the impacts of the pandemic on our people. How are we faring? How are things looking from where you are and uh, from the point of view of the people you're in contact with? So perhaps if we start with you, Mark, again, and uh, see how we go. Yeah, no worries. Uh, we'll see how we go. Um, <laughs> that's, that's always the guiding principle with me, I think. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of things that have been that uh, over the course of this year that has, in, in the work that I do, a lot of it is behind, um, uh, through the screen, through this medium. Uh, so I, I normally work from home, but what usually would happen is we'd have uh, meetings and meetings and meetings and then I'd fly somewhere and then fly somewhere and then be on the ground in a leadership um, delivery capacity or a community meeting or something like that. So there's been an absence of flying around since March. So people have had to adapt to being on and doing this sort of engagement. But what, what has risen up is um, there's, there's three dynamics I just wanted to point out and I'll try and be uh, quite uh, brief and contained with that. The first dynamic is people are being reminded of um, the impact of uh, authoritarian figurity in their movement. And for some people, it's like, I don't know why this is triggering a, a, a response in me, but it is triggering a response in me. I don't know what it is. Others are very clear on it. This is like when we, this is like when we were growing up and this could do that. So the imagery of authority, authoritarian figures dictating one time that thing about that I've been working with and it's bringing up some stuff of them. The second dynamic is people are speaking about from a strength-based approach. They have found an ability to be adaptive 
and exercise cultural resilience that has given them a greater capability to deal with the uncertainty of the pandemic. So people are drawing on the fact that they have had to work through restrictions like this before. They've had to work through an uncertainty around um, employment, around the way that they may be treated, et cetera, et cetera. And they are exercising and drawing from a cultural resilience that is helping them to deal with the uncertainty of the pandemic. The third one though, is one that is largely based on fear and anxiety. Uh, fear and anxiety that the virus may come into our communities and it may devastate our communities. And so that's also being talked about from um, uh, you know, a mental health point of view that people are feeling a greater, a greater rising sense of, of fear and anxiety and it's impacting the way that they live and move. But they're also genuinely, um, um, as, as we've seen with other uh, populations around the world, it's like, you don't come in, don't, don't look at us, don't breathe on us. Um, you know, we're, we're really afraid of people who come in, in and out of communities. So there's been a, uh, those three sorts of, of dynamics that I've seen as part of the way that people have been coping with uh, coronavirus here in Australia so far. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I think uh, some of those things will be uh, part of our conversation in a number of ways as we move forward. So thank you. Uh, Victor, do you want to say a little bit about how you think, think uh, it's going around the communities you engage with? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, the impact um, from up here within uh, the remoteness of North Queensland certainly varies to what the impact has been further south, of course. Um, due to the restrictions and, and, and how they are got, how they are, uh, I suppose, enforced. Uh, since the restrictions took place, um, especially in the state of Queensland, uh, most of the remote communities uh, through their own local authorities um, certainly drew the line in the sand um, because, of, because, of these, um, because of the virus and the impact that it could do um, if, it, if it was to um, infect a, a person within a remote community. So, so I guess from, from, from my perspective, and I, I just want to say this very quickly, Gary, and I, and, uh, is that uh, when I'm speaking here today, I'm not speaking on, on just on my voice, I'm speaking on the voice of many because of who I represent. And I think that's important for the viewers to understand that it's not one person collect one voice or collect sorry, personal opinion here. It's an opinion that has come uh, from, from, from my elders and, and, and important people that, that, uh, that were impacted by this so that I could bring to this uh, discussion here this morning. Hmm. Um, so the impact has been, uh, has certainly been, um, and, and, I, and I don't want to go too, too long here, uh, taking into account what you just said, there's going to be other, very, other questions uh, on this. But I, I, I think from, from our perspective and from the college perspective especially, was the impact certainly restricted our students uh, of the college from, from, from continuing their studies um, because, the, because our people, uh, as you would be, um, as you know, um, we are so used to face-to-face -face learning because that's where we benefit mostly. And so trying to have different modes of delivery to, to our students um, certainly, um, it, it was good in a sense, but also there was a lot of challenges with that as well due to the remoteness. Mm. But overall, the impact uh, has, has been that uh, it certainly did affect our, our, our cultural framework um, and, and the way we live. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Naomi. Yeah. Um... It's been a challenging time for, for many people, um, particularly with lockdown and remote schooling um, for not only um, school students, but university students. And we start to see that, um, you know, some of our students, particularly in the NATES program, and I know um, students that I work with at ACU, if they can't get access to the university campus or a community organisation or McDonald's for Wi-Fi or the local library, 
when you're on lockdown, um, you may not have enough bandwidth at home, you may not have enough prepaid internet. So some of the things that universities and institutions rely on, regular access to computers, regular um, internet, um, good internet, for students to be able to engage in remote learning, um, these become real challenges and stresses for families. And so um, we do see resilience. We do see mobs um, swapping computers. Uh, there's all sorts of groups online where um, <clears throat> people, you know, have responded uh, to community need because um, institutions by their very nature weren't being as responsible or responsive is perhaps a uh, better word, responsive um, to community needs. So being online and being part of those online groups in order to share resources uh, uh, is just another way of what we would normally do in community. But um, it's very hard for many students because they don't have the resources. Um, and then there's the concept of um, shame of not sort of speaking up too loudly. Then with the uh, lockdown that's been happening, particularly when the towers in Melbourne were locked down, many of our community, you know, that, that wasn't well done. Uh, I understand some of the reasons why, but it wasn't well done. And there was a lot of panic because suddenly police were there and you couldn't leave your flat and no one was explaining why. And then there was worry about food. Um, there was worry about elders. There was worry about carers not being able to come in for people who have Indeed. children with special yeah. needs um, and so on. So um, there is a big worry about over-policing um, that generally happens, the lack of discretionary powers that police uh, don't use with our people and other marginalised groups. And when we're in a state of disaster or state of emergency, I can't remember which one we're in. There's the worry that um, that uh, those encounters will, with police uh, will be exacerbated. Um, and, and just other things that community have been saying, you know, the, the constant stress of having to um, rebut things like um, the blame for the Black Lives Matter uh, you know, protests being in the media constantly, despite there being absolutely no evidence that 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 protest is blamed for the, um, you know, this <clears throat> the second the second wave um, <clears throat> of COVID. Excuse me. And so many many people are, are trying to sort of counter nonsense with facts, and it's it's exhausting. Um, so, yeah, and I think the other thing is when when there's a pandemic like this and people go panic buying, um, if you have the resources to go stock up, that's one thing, but many of our people live from pay to pay. And so when the payday came around and you went to the supermarket, there was nothing there. Um, and so people were, you know, worried and then... Um, you know, you get calls from community members saying, do you have this, do you have that? And we, we all swap and do what we can. But there's another worry. If I don't have this, what will the school say? And will they tell welfare? And if I don't have this, and so there's a flow on effect. You know, when is welfare gonna rock, a rock up to my door and, and ask what's going on? Hmm. You know, is child protection going to get involved because, you know, my IGA has no toilet paper and I have this and I have that and, and you know, there's no other options. So there's all of those big concerns about, um, you know, resources and, um, and also care of our elders, you know, elders who can't get out and um, shop and, you know... If you take things to elders, you're, you're worrying, am I taking the virus to them? Um, you know, who's going to look after them? You know, the fact that if an elder goes into hospital and they're on their own, you know, and that's not usually how we do things. If someone is dying, normally we don't leave them by themselves, but the hospital rules and regulations are real strict and I understand some of the reasons around that, but... Um, 
you know, it just breaks your heart to think of anybody dying in that situation. But that that's that's me. I fear I've spoken too much, but um, there are good things too. I think resilience, our, our mob are used to making do in many ways. And so that resilience comes to the fore and there's been some great recipes and great, um, you know, good memories and things swapped online and, and, and via Zoom too. It's been great. Thank you, Naomi. Glenn. Gary, um, as I said before, I'm in Glen Iris, which is not known for its uh, overindulgence of uh, overpopulation of Indigenous people. Um, but the, the issues for me and, and the issues that I've seen for our people have been, uh, came right, came very clearly at the very beginning of this whole process when our um, uh, the government, federal government, said that people at risk were those over 70 and Aboriginal people over 50. I think one of the things that this whole process is, is identified for us as a people is that we are still behind and seen as a deficit people in the midst of this process. I think one of the things that we've done very well as a people is to, to live out our isolation and our patience and our capacity to be uh, able to care for ourselves in the midst of all this. But the idea that we're still behind and we still are not given the same kind of freedom to make decisions, Naomi's alluded to it, um, uh, Victor and uh, Graham have, have, uh, have spoke about it, we are seen as being deficit and behind other people and not given the opportunity. One of the smiles I get is that it's great in Melbourne now that even white people have to have permits to go to work. Um, and I, I kind of find that as an interesting process for, for us to remember. Um, I just like the idea that people have to have permits to go to work now when we had to have permits to do anything back in the 40s, 50s and 60s. So it is this connection, um, the isolation, we've always been in isolation. So in many ways it's helped our resilience under these circumstances. My concern is the over-policing, the over-regulation um, uh, of our people. Because we're seen as deficit people, we are not given the capacity to make the kind of decisions and to allow our elders, as Victor was talking about, to be, to be sovereign and responsible in their place for their people and their processes. You know, the closing of um, access to um, Uluru by the local people was an example of this thinking ahead of working and of doing what is right for us. This sense of autonomy, which is a part of who we are as a people. And they're all important things. Um, Somehow we have to help and, and support our people to, to be aware that they are enough. They are able to deal with this. And I've had more experience of dealing with this isolation and a virus, because um, they've been healing with a virus for 250 years, um, than anybody else. And we need to give them the capacity to do so and tell them that they can do. And I think that's an important part of what we're learning here. One of the positives that have come out of for me is that the Black Lives Matter March and the coronavirus has sparked up incredible interest inside schools and education systems. And I'm heavily involved now since this all began with poor schools, doing a whole lot of education and, and telling people, you know, we're okay. You know, you know we, we uh, have a sophisticated way of being. And so I think that's been a positive too for us. And Black Lives Matter, has been powerful in this process as well. Thank you, Glenn. Perhaps uh, the one thing that I might add to uh, what the rest of you mob have said is that um, just about everyone I talk to uh, in community um, echoes, echoes my experience of uh, just feeling a bit lost in not being able to go back to country. Um, of being locked in or locked out. I mean, 
in many ways we locked out anyway uh, because it, so much of country is now private land under the control of someone else. Mm. But even those parts of country that we, we can go back to and we do go back to uh, in order to reconnect with um, the ground of our being, if you want to put it that way, <laughs> Um, we can't do that at the moment in, in many places. Um, and uh, that, that's the part of this whole thing that I, I struggle with most, I've got to say. Uh, not being able to get back there because I'm locked in and I'm locked out. Um, I find that really, really tough to deal with. And, uh, you know, I can get on the phone and I can, I can do this kind of thing once a week with mob down in, down in Tassie. But... Um, but every time I do that, it's sort of like uh, the, the longing to get back there <laughs> and uh, and go for a swim. Um, you know, uh, Victor and I have talked before about us both being island people. <laughs> you know, he he's from the islands way up there. We're from the islands down there. You know, <laughs> and uh, just just that longing to get down there and get in the water. Um, in, in my place, in my country, is is really palpable. And every time I talk to mum and dad or, or my sisters, um, I, I, I just long for that. So, yeah, I think that's probably the toughest thing for me. And, uh, and I'm on a pretty good wicket, as they say. So, yeah. Anyway, look, we'll, we'll move on because um, I've got some other questions to ask you fellas. So... Um, as, uh, as, as all of us have alluded to in one way or another already, um, this COVID pandemic is not for our mobs, their first encounter with a dangerous disease that's arrived from somewhere else. Um, there is a sense in which uh, our mobs associate this particular virus with echoes and memories of colonisation. Just wondering um, if we could reflect a little bit more on that. Um, you know, what are the memories that get triggered um, so, Mark, maybe you could start off and talk a little bit more about those triggers that you referred to earlier. Yeah, well, I, I, I want to talk about it in, in, in two ways. One is um, a bit of a, a trigger from a, a negative point of view, but also then one of uh, a really interesting way that I've, I've um, heard, heard people talk about how we, we cope with this coming, mm. you know, and this, this happened quite early, like in April. Uh, so in, in terms of the, the, f the first trigger from a negative sense, yeah, it's, it is seen as, um, uh, look, we, we are again are being faced with something that is, has found its way onto our land mm. without permission, without invitation, and it has the potential to devastate all of, all of us in community. And we don't have the... the um, the, the, the stuff in our spirit to repel it. We don't have the stuff um, that the, you know, the um, modern medical doctors are talking about to be able to have an immune system to repel it. It, it, it penetrates into our community and it gets us. And we didn't ask for it. And we weren't the jet setting tourists as well who brought it back. So I don't know how it got here. So you can, you can find the thing of this unwanted, uh, uninvited, threat coming in and that certainly triggers for people who have who have the memory the living memory of colonization and the impact that just triggers all kinds of all, all kinds of trauma the, there is another thing though and uh, because I, I also want to be able to talk about some of the um almost like playful but certainly strength cult and this is what i talked about in terms of cultural resilience People earlier on were talking about how, okay, the, 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 the language around social distancing, physical distancing, oh, we've got to perhaps not handshake anymore. We've got to perhaps not, not do all that. And you get the superficial stuff of saying, oh, we can't hug each other anymore. We can't do all that kind of stuff. Oh, well, okay, well, how are we going to survive in community, et cetera, et cetera. And then people started talking about, wait a second, we, we have a thing in our kinship of avoidance relationships. We have a whole knowledge base in our kinship way of being, which is like avoidance or, or, or poison cousin or, or, or where we stay away from each other. And for those who, who aren't aware of it, this is like a, a cultural um, way of saying you show respect and dignity to that person 
by deliberately creating distance and avoidance to them. That's how you show respect to them. You don't show respect to them by uh, walking up to them and looking them in the eye and saying, let me shake your hand and call you by your first name because we're both buddies. So no, no, that's a senior woman. You don't do that to senior women. You need to practice avoidance. And so we had people talking about how, well, we just got to treat everyone like they're in an avoidance relationship. We just have to draw on our cultural capability and use our cultural resilience and treat everyone like they're in avoidance. Treat everyone like they are poison cousin until this pandemic goes. And I just thought that was a brilliant way of reframing using our cultural ways and not seeing the, the, the onslaught of the, of the virus into our communities as just the negativity that is gonna come and get us. But we actually have a cultural way of understanding a, a mechanism to, to manage our way through it. And it's not called lockdown. It's not called authority suppressing us. It's about us saying, we just go, we have to treat everyone like their poison cousin and really just keep our distance and actually show dignity and respect to each other by doing that. There's just two ways. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, what have you got to say about this, mate? Yeah. Colonisation echoes. <laughs> I'm going to keep mine short on this uh, particular subject here, Gary. Um, I, I mentioned previously about the cultural framework um, and that that makes up of who we are uh, as an as a Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person or both. Um, since the impact of these of the, of the COVID and, uh, and and the restrictions that came with that, the, the cultural framework. I'm going to talk about from the Torres Strait perspective. The cultural framework within the Torres Strait was greatly impacted to an extent because of what makes us who we are as an individual, but also our identity and, and, and where we're from, from each particular island. So when that restrictions fell into place, the framework was challenged because the idea then became the realization, wait, hold on, we're going backwards here again to how it ex existed when missionaries came when colonization came. So therefore the reminder was, was, was brought back into a reality for the current generation based on the stories that was told by our elders and forefathers. And, for, and, and, and I guess our, the current generation then began to see a reality of what it was like to an extent. It, 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 it's different in, in a sense, if I, if I can say that, but the framework was still there but then all of a sudden, then with, through the restrictions on this virus, um, the, 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 the governance, the, the government framework then began to, I guess, challenge the cultural framework. So therefore, our elders and our leaders, local leaders up in the Torres Strait had to make a stand. So they had to work within, uh, with, with respect to the local authorities and to the, to the state and Commonwealth uh, government authorities of this, of this uh, of these restrictions that brought the thinking again of colonization to our people up in the islands. Um, but at the same time, we had, to, we had to work within the cultural framework to say, hold on. And I think Mark touched on that, is that, you know, so you're saying that I can't go, go next door to see someone, to see my family, because the family kingship makes up of who we are. So the kingship within the family then was quite challenged uh, because of this, and so when that family kingship became uh, was 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 being challenged, the people within the family kingship began to see that this is not going to work to an extent. But yet, at the same time, we have to respect those in authority um, that that govern the crown rules of the land. But at the same time, we're talk, we're trying to deal with family bereavements within these restrictions. That, that, uh, that when, when we have a family bereavement, if I can say this, since March until today, I've had, I, I've had to officiate in four Indigenous funerals within these restrictions. So it was a quite challenging from a ministry perspective as well. So for me, I've got, my, I've got three framework, frameworks working within me. My cultural framework, the framework of the government or, of, or, 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 and the law of the day, and then also I've got the ministry framework as well, the church. So these three frameworks is, 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 is quite impacting in terms of the thinking of this colonization, meaning 
that's, that continues to affect our people. And especially when it comes to um, separation, how much more separated do we need to be to an extent? We live in the most remote part of Australia, but yet we have to apply by the same restrictions than in the urban and the metropolitan areas. But yet we, we were the last, very last, to have restrictions lifted. Why, why, why were we treated differently to, to the rest of the country or to the rest of the state when there was greater movement of people in the urban and metropolitan areas compared to the remote? So, so those, those frameworks, um, Gary, that I, and, I, and I keep referring to that because that, that makes up who, who I am, um, the, the thinking at the back of our minds from a Torres Strait perspective was that when, it, when we started realizing that there was a reminder there of colonization, because it also restricted movement between people from one island to another. And we couldn't do that as well. So mm -hmm. therefore we were, each community was in lockdown so no one couldn't go out and, and be part of the cultural way of life to go out to do their fishing for, for their food, etc., or to visit a family driven in, in a nearby island because of, the, because of these restrictions. Mm -hmm. So I guess in a sense that, uh, and I'm not going to finish up here because I, I'll, I'll get carried away sometimes, Gary, forgive me, is that um, it certainly did impact us within the Torres Strait. Uh, and I might just leave it as that for now. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Naomi, I know you'll have a few things to say about this too. Yeah, I think um, for many older people, it reminds them of uh, previous times when th there's been restrictions and also the lack of access to health. And I think for many in our community, sorry, that's a rare plane flying over. Um, many in our community, uh, they worry because they already have pre-existing conditions and what does that mean and we're constantly seeing in the news that you know again from that deficit model but also um, you know if, if you're a certain age if you are Aboriginal if you've got comorbidities then you're more likely to die um, and you know it's it's very confronting and um, the usual support mechanisms of going and, you know, just being with your mob or going home, as you say, Gary, you know, at the moment, for those of us in Victoria, no one wants us, um, <laughs> you know, we can't go anywhere. Um, and so, you know, Zoom and things like that are great when you kind of um, have a connectedness, but it also, yeah, there's a grief there too, because you really want to be home and, uh, you can't. Um, and as I say, you want to be able to support people in hospital and you want to make sure that they can get to appointments and things, but there's always that constant worry. Um, you know, the, the worry of, do I have the right paperwork on me? So if I am pulled over, will I get a fine? And if I get a fine, how will I pay that? Um, or, uh, you know, if I get through that process and I get to where I need to go to help someone in community, am I going to make them sick? Are they going to make me sick? Or am I going to pass it on someone else? So there's all of those challenges that um, some of the older elders were saying, you know, we used to have these challenges when we were younger. We used to worry about, do I have permission to go where I'm going? What, you know, what am I going to say? Who, you know, things like, um, you know, I hope a certain police officer will be the person who asks me the questions and not this police officer. And for many of our older people, it does trigger some of those memories. But then you also get the stories of how um, communities circumvented some of those systems, you know, how we were cheeky and move things around. And um, particularly one elder this week reminded me of the story of how... Um, when welfare were coming to visit them on the mission, uh, you know, the, and checking the cupboards to see that they had enough food and that they had all of these things, that they would send the kids out the back and around to the next house in order to have, you know, these, these cans and things that were moving. Um, and she said, it's a wonder welfare didn't wake up, but they never did. 
so in one community there were kind of these you know on one mish there were these cans that nobody ate or or opened because they were kind of the welfare cans that just got moved around from house to house to make it look like that they had enough food and they had enough food because they were going out you know hunting and stuff um but that wasn't the acceptable way the acceptable way was for when mission you know the welfare people came and they opened the covers and saw big stocks of stuff and went yep these people are acting as they should do move on to the next person so you get those good stories as well and and i'm grateful for that because um you you get the lived experience that we often um read about in history books and things or particularly those of us who teach at university we set readings but to actually hear the lived experience is amazing thanks naomi glenn uh, the painting that you use to um promote this um little event um, is called COVID-1770. Um, what happened when Cook sneezed? And it alludes to the fact that we've been living with a virus called colonialism uh, ever since um, 1788, and that we have had to learn to, to adapt and to work within side those things that we have no control over. We have no control over the kind of uh, way we're treated and the way we are seen, but we do have, as both Victor, uh, as Victor has referred to, um, and Mark has referred to, is through our own, um, our own cultural systems, our own cultural ways of being, our own cultural processes, to work with and to adapt and to deal with the virus, whether it's colonialism or whether it's COVID. So I think it's, um, it does bring back echoes and memories of colonisation. Um, it does bring back echoes and memories of, of what it's important and how it is important to be connected to country and to culture. Um, for those of us who are way off country and for people like myself whose connection to, to culture is very um, uh, tenuous simply because of our our upbringing and our, our background. Um, one of the things that we have to remember in the middle of all of this, it doesn't matter where we are, if we're in isolation, we're still on country because we bring the country with us in our bodies and our bodies carry that country and it carries the culture and it carries uh, the sense of who we are and our identity. So one of the things that I think that and I've been talking to people about is that Yes, you may be in isolation, but you have everything that you need within yourself to deal with that isolation. It's, it's in you because of who you are. It's in you because of where you were born. It's in you because of the country out of which you were born. And you bring that, that um, autonomy and sovereignty with you. So you, you can deal with this issue. The practicalities of that becomes obviously difficult which all have alluded to um, and uh, it's interesting because we need to understand in, in, in approaching these questions that you've given us that it's a variety or a kaleidoscope of approaches uh, and responses to COVID for depending on where people are, depending on where people live, depending on uh, you know their connections to culture, you know, as Victor tells us, it's very different up where he is and for his culture than it is for us living here in Melbourne, in, uh, in, in um, you know, Wuhan on the Yarra, where we were all locked down and we we're all kept away from each other. So one of the strengths, I think, and one of the things I think our people had all the way through colonisation is we know who we are. And we are patient and we will deal and adapt and because we've been dealing and adapting for 65,000 plus years. Um, so we are and will adapt and we have to help each other to do that and remind each other that we are not deficit people. We're not deficit people. We are sufficient and sophisticated and at home in this place. 
So I think that's important for us to remember. Thank you, Glenn. Well, because um, I didn't want any of you to go away feeling unchallenged, I thought I'd throw in a really wobbly question. Um, so here's the wobbly question. There's stories in the Bible of God sending wasting diseases upon the people of Israel because of their wickedness or disobedience. And there are stories uh, from our own dreaming places, um, which are a bit similar. Um, so is there any way in which we might read the COVID pandemic as in some sense a judgment from God or our ancestral spirits? If so, who and what is being judged? So, Mark, what do you reckon? Yeah, I, <laughs> I was... Um, <laughs> Uh, challenged mostly by this uh, question, who and what is being judged? Okay, um, really quickly, because I really enjoy hearing the, the, the different perspectives from each of the speakers. It's really great to hear that, um, you know, we're getting different angles from, from different places. It's fantastic. So I'll be, I'll be brief. I want to introduce this notion of shallow memory and deep memory. Yeah. Shallow memory would look at what happened last year that made the virus come this year? What wickedness did we do last year that made the virus come this year? What wickedness did we do last year that made locusts arrive in Africa? You know, what wickedness happened in the like, and if we just do that, then we, we might pick something that theologically we may not agree with or, or like or, um, uh, feel um, is aligned with our understanding of being a follower of Christ and we'll say that thing there is the reason why COVID-19 has happened and we will there we go shallow memory will do that whereas deep memory will take a look at what we have done as a humanity over many many generations and so I want to draw a deeper memory of the wickedness that began where some people could travel across the seas and say any idea or notion that these people have with their land and with their understanding of relationship with um, the transcendent and creation and human existence and morality, all of that is irrelevant. I come with greater knowledge, a greater understanding about the transcendent and, and the way to look after creation. And I name this place as nothing, I now, you know, and all the people as nothing, and so I therefore bring my own stuff. Now, it wasn't an I, it was a very much a lot of us. I'm talking about the doctrine of discovery. Um, and in doing so, over the last 500 years, we've ended up with a global system, big systems that, that perpetuate their own way of saying a handful of people own most of the stuff. And then a lot of people will go wanting to get up that ladder and most people then beyond that have no chance. So we have enslaved really the lower classes, lower socioeconomic. Um, McCrindle will show you in their the five uh, quintiles or five um, uh, where they will set up, um, they'll, they'll look at Australia's um, uh, wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. I think the top 20% has 50% of the money and 60% of the wealth. And the bottom 20% has like 4% of the money and 1% of the wealth. And if you think of wealth in terms of property and, you know, that sort of stuff. So we have a system around the world here in Australia as well. And to me, that feels like a wickedness that is much longer than just what did we do last year that caused this thing to come. That's all I've got. Thanks. Well said. Well said, Mark. Peter, what do you reckon, mate? Thanks, Gary. Uh, I, I, I pulled up a bubble verse that I thought that could probably help with my explanation here. Um, and, it, and it comes from the New Living Translation from Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And, and while, while it's been a quite, uh, you know, very negative views of the majority in terms of this virus and, and how it's come about. 
I, I, I guess to, to try and respond um, to the best I, I can to your question, Gary, in regards to whether um, there were, um, I guess, judgment, um, as you said it, as you used that word, um, I think the final judgment is, just, is yet to come. I think, once again, I think Mark just touched on that, that the minority will always suffer the greatest in, in terms of anything that's, that, that's a worldwide or, or pandemic um, or, or any sort of virus or disease. Um, we are always going to be the last to actually benefit of, of anything positive out of these, uh, out of this very difficult time that we're in. Um, from a from a Torah Strait perspective, it actually strengthened the faith of 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 the people, knowing that these things are happening, not not only in Australia but also around the world, and there are other disasters, other situations that are happening around the world as well. So I guess the faith is strengthened in a very positive way, knowing that we have to rely not on, we have to rely on, on, our, on, on our creator uh, for all things. And I think that's very, very important for us um, in, in, in regards to um, of the thinking whether or not this is a judgment from God. I guess it's a test of our faith, uh, if I can put that, Gary, in, in regards to where we are right now in, in, in our relationship uh, with our creator. Um, so, so I guess from, from to, to you know, and I'll, I'll stop here because I'm very conscious of the time here, is that, um, you know, uh, the creation stories that have come about from a Torah Strait perspective, um, I have, have touched on a bit to an extent in terms of, of, of sicknesses and diseases, but there were also, um, you know, cultural rules already in place that was there for a reason. And I guess it's important for us to be reminded of that, that we have need to go back and at times reflect on these cultural laws um, of who we are as a trusted person, but also more important of who we are as a Christian trusted person as well, because now we have the benefit of both in our spiritual walk. Absolutely. Thank you, Victor. Naomi, what do you reckon about this? You didn't say there was going to be tough questions like this. Oh, Jeez. come on. <laughs> Throwing theology into it? Jeepers. Um, I don't believe that um, this is God's sending a uh, kind of a, you know, a biblical judgment against people. I, from my reading of the biblical judgments, they were for really specific things against specific sins and specific people who were sinning, um, you know, plagues and boils and all sorts of things. Um, but I do think that this is an opportunity or a call for us to review and return to what God wants us to be, um, connected people who are focusing on what's necessary, what's important. And so much of our world uh, is focused on the unimportant, um, you know, uh, celebrity uh, sort of fixations and so on. The latest technology rather than what the technology can do for us. Um, and I think, you know, often people will say, oh, well, where is God in all of this? But I think one of the things that we need to remember as people, Oh dear. Uh, whatever the, uh, you know, God comes in the form of a healthcare worker who is working day in, day out, can come in a quiet word of encouragement. Um, you know, the local, the local kid who, who does the bag shopping, you know, the bag, you know, when you do your supermarket shopping and, and that person says, how's your day? The, the little things actually do mean a lot in these times when you have less contact with other people. But I don't think that this is kind of the uh, uh, 
uh, end of the world kind of revelations, uh, Armageddon kind of movie version of, of some kind of form of judgment. But I do think it is an opportunity to review our own personal and our own community situation. How can we respond to the inequities that COVID-19 have made very clear to us, even more clear? You know, how do we do, how do we respond to homeless people in a pandemic? But how do we, once the pandemic's gone, how do we make sure that those homeless people aren't forgotten? How do we respond to mental health? Especially now, but when the crisis is over, people people talk about getting back to the getting back to normal. Well, I for one don't want that. Thanks. Normal doesn't work. Normal isn't working for many of our communities. So how do how do we make the new way of life better and more in keeping with um, harmony and creation and more in keeping with uh, love and honour and um, resilience rather than transitory stuff like, you know, all of the materialism that seems to be um, a fixation of our our current age. That's my answer to your curly question, Gary. So there you go. Nice work on that, Naomi. Nice work. (laughs) (laughs) Glenn, you got three minutes, bro. My response is is that this is a judgment not from God, but a judgment we've brought upon ourselves. And it's a judgment that we have given to ourselves because of our inability to, to live in relationship with one another and our kin, which isn't just the people with the whole of the universe. Um, Kelly Arabina talks about being indigenous of the universe and being and belonging to the whole. And our, our issue is with, with this uh, and other things leads back to where Mark was speaking and um, uh, about the 500 year project and the way um, people have come in, taken over, dismissed the sophisticated cultures that have been there and the uh, custodial ethic that has been a part of our lives which is that sense of responsibility and reciprocity to all things and creatures. We've dished that, we've moved it, and we've turned the environment, the, you know, our mother country, our kin, trees, rivers, forests, into um, products to be sold, commodities, and people into simply, uh, we want to close the gap so Aboriginal people become more productive. So we, we turn people into widgets so that we create this whole process. So I think COVID and some of the other things that we've been facing are our own judgment of ourselves, our own judgment on ourselves. We brought that judgment. I definitely don't think in terms of uh, God going, you know, you waste of space, you oxygen thieves are going to teach you a lesson. And I don't, but I do think our mother, uh, the earth in which we live sometimes gets to the stage where she says, just need to give you guys a smack on the bum with a wooden spoon and remind you that you are the centre of the world. You aren't the ones in the centre. And I do think also that in this way, if the universe is mind-bogglingly big, God is mind-bogglingly bigger. And, and, and that's something. There's an excellent book on this by uh, Daniel Castillo, which is called an ecology, ecological theology of liberation, salvation, and ecolo- political ecology, which addresses this very question. So it's worth a read. Perfect. Thank you, Glenn. Well, we've run out of time, <coughs> but um, I wanted to thank uh, each of our panelists for uh, being in this conversation. I want to thank uh, Naomi and Victor and Mark and Glenn. And uh, Di sends her apologies um, because she's dealing with some very real practical stuff in the prison around uh, mob and deaths and not being able to get out of prison to be at funerals and all that sort of stuff. So uh, she sends her apologies. But thank you to our panellists. Thank you to Peter Sherlock who got on to me and said, Barry, it'd be good if um, you could get get some people together and talk about this stuff. 
Uh, thank you to Meg Nelson, who has uh, been running the show for us today from the tech end. Thank you, Meg. And I also just want to um, remind you all again that about Glenn's uh, book, because I'm on commission here, uh, On Being Blackfellas Young Fella, uh, Reflections on Being Aboriginal in Australia. Uh, well worth the read. I'm about that, that far through it so far, Glenn. And um, I'm going to ask Meg just finally to bring up the uh, UD page, which talks about our NAITS program, that is our Indigenous Studies program here in the UD. And um, if anyone would like to uh, follow up, um, you can find some information on that uh, web page on the University of Divinity. There's a few mob there from around here and a few mob from Canada on, in the photo there. So. Um, so please do have a look at that uh, and, and, and let people know that this is an opportunity. Uh, people can study um, Indigenous theology at a higher degree level um, in Australia now, um, courtesy of the programs that we're running. So thank you again to everyone who's been involved today and um, good wishes for whatever you need to do to get through this thing. Farewell. <laughs>